God, we thank you so much for another opportunity to come and sit under your word, to be instructed by you so that we might grow in our earnest devotion, wholehearted worship, that you might be pleased and glorified in us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. It is my joy to welcome you to our evening service tonight. Uh, you haven't seen me in this pulpit before, so for those of you who don't know me, as Chris said, my name is Jackson Kennedy. Uh, the, most, uh, the, the best thing about me that you need to know is that I have a wonderful wife named Ashley and four cute little kiddos. Uh, we've been coming here since August of 2020, members in December of 2020. And as Chris said, I get to lead a small group here at the church as well as attend classes at the Expositor Seminary. But it is my great privilege to open God's word with you tonight. So go ahead and open your Bibles to Psalm 15. I've learned that asking good questions is an excellent skill to have. Helps with decision making, counseling, preaching, parenting. Becoming a thoughtful question asker will help you navigate life across the board. I need to become a better question asker. I need to grow in this skill. And it may not be more evident than it is in some of my when I get to heaven questions. Do you have those questions that the answer to them, there is no humanly possible way for you to know as long as you remain here on the earth, but you want to know? Or maybe questions about what's it going to be like when I get there? Things that you need to be in the presence of omniscience to get the answer to. I've thought, these are real thoughts that I've had. Um, who are my neighbors going to be in heaven? Jesus says there's many dwelling places. So where am I going to live? Who's going to be around me? Is my dog there? Scripture talks about when Jesus lands on Mount Zion and he splits it open and there's a river flowing through it into Jerusalem and into the sea. I have wondered, will we get to fish in that river? Do you need a license? Certainly won't be the first things that I ask, I'm sure. Uh, I've wondered as I held a cold, refreshing glass of ice water, uh, just aware of the millions of molecules that are in it and knowing that each one of those has a story the first day of creation, all of those molecules were, were there, and somehow in God's providence, they were brought into my cup for me to be refreshed as I drink them. I want to know what rivers did those molecules flow through? What oceans were they consumed in? What other beings drank them and then expelled them, and then they're purified through evaporation however many times? I... I'm so curious about that. I'm fascinated by that. And all of it marks God's providence to bring this refreshing glass of water to me. Those are some of my silly when I get to heaven questions. Hopefully your when I get to heaven questions are more profound and better than mine are. But even if not, even if yours are just as lousy as mine, I have some good news for you tonight. In our passage, we are given the question. This is really good news because it is a crucial question. It's a question that trumps all others and it must be dealt with and answered if we are to have the hope of heaven or the comfort of assurance. Question we're given tonight in Psalm 15 is, O oh Yahweh, who may sojourn in your tent? And another, who may dwell on your holy mountain. Who gets to be with God? Who has a home with him and safety with him? There's no weightier question for us to consider, and we need to answer it with clarity. And David, who wrote this psalm, knew this, and so he wrote it to be sung. He put it in the songbook of Israel so that with regularity, as the people sang this, they would be catechized with this question. And I've got more good news for you tonight. We are also given the answer to the question. So pay attention while I read Psalm 15. O oh, Yahweh, who may sojourn in your tent? 
Who may dwell on your holy mountain? He who walks blamelessly and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. He does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. In whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear Yahweh. He swears to his own hurt and he does not change. He does not put out his money at interest, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. Tonight, from this text, we will be considering three incredible possessions of Zion's inhabitants that ought to promote humble self-examination and earnest devotion. So the first one of these incredible possessions is the distinctive privilege of Zion's inhabitants. Look again at verse one. We have those questions. O Yahweh, who may sojourn in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy mountain? So we'll consider these questions and some of the differences between them. But first of all, notice who they're addressed to. They're addressed to Yahweh, the most high God, the holy one of Israel, Israel's covenant keeping God. Yahweh is his name. And the question that's being asked here is not only a necessary one, as I said, but it is an incredibly bold question to ask. Almost seems to border upon presumption. Who can dwell with God? Who can dare to come near him? He's so holy that sinless angels in Isaiah 6 cover their feet in their face. They don't even dare to look at him. And sinful man would ask, who will dwell with you, God? This is staggering. And we ought to read these questions in such a way that they strike us. This isn't just the introduction to the psalm, but this is the question that we need. It is one that we have no right to ask, except for grace. So David wants to know, who can sojourn in Yahweh's tent? The idea of sojourning is not an unfamiliar one in our Bible. We remember the patriarchs like Abraham who sojourned in a land that was not yet his, but was promised to him. And he sojourned going from place to place in his tent without having anywhere to call his own. There are a few ideas that tend to get wrapped up with the idea of sojourning. We might think of foreigners, people who don't belong here. I don't think that's the main emphasis. I think what David's getting at is the idea of being welcomed, finding safe rest from wandering. Interestingly, to care for the sojourner was a responsibility that God placed upon the nation of Israel. They were to treat them well, to care for them, to show hospitality to them. Leviticus 19.10 says this, Nor shall you glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather the fallen fruit of your vineyard, you shall leave them for the afflicted and for the sojourner. I am Yahweh, your God. And so the nation was to care for sojourners by not going back through their vineyards and their fields and getting everything. If it fell on the ground, leave it. Let a sojourner come and have that food. Verses 33 and 34 of the same chapter. When a sojourner sojourns with you in your land, you shall not mistreat him. The sojourner who sojourns with you shall be to you as the native among you. And you shall love him as yourself. For you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. I am Yahweh, your God. So God tells his people, treat the sojourner like a native born. Make no distinction, have no partiality, but love him. Just like you ought to love your brother, your fellow Israelite. And then this is really interesting. In this next verse, Leviticus 25, 35 says, now if a brother of yours becomes poor and his means with regard to you falter, then you are to sustain him like a sojourner or a foreign resident that he may live with you. So God says, treat the sojourner like a native born. And when a native born Israelite falls into a need, treat him as well as you would a sojourner. It's interesting. These are God's commands and they reflect his desires. They reflect his character. 
So David is asking the God who commands safe harbor and hospitality for sojourners if he would do the same. And who are those sojourners that you would accept? Specifically, who would he allow to sojourn in his tent? The tent here is the tabernacle. The fact that David mentions the tabernacle seems to imply that he wrote this psalm before the construction of the temple, probably after the ark and tabernacle were brought to Jerusalem, although there's no way to determine exactly when it was written. But this is the tent that Moses had made according to God's command and according to God's specifications. And it was a temporary meeting place, but it was the place where the worship of God was carried out. Here, the sacrifices, the washings, the incense, the holy of holies, the ark, the tabernacle was the locale for Yahweh worship. David wants to know, who can find a place there? Who can sojourn there? Who will find ready acceptance to that place of worship? Or we might say it another way, God, whose worship will you accept? greatest need is to answer this question. Maybe a bigger question than we acknowledge at first blush when we read through the text. If you were reading Romans today, you might be expecting this to be a rhetorical question, followed by the thesis statement of depravity. Uh, Who can dwell with God? No one is good. No, not one. No one seeks after God. There's no one who understands. But that isn't what follows. As I said earlier, shockingly, this question is answered. There is a people who will receive this privilege. There will be inhabitants in Zion. This is a privilege that goes beyond the ability to even appreciate or ever to begin to make a return on. This is utter grace. Those who understand God's holiness, his otherness, and excuse me, those who don't understand God's holiness, his otherness, and his separateness from all of his creation might assume that to ask this question is no big deal. It's no hassle. Just have God open the door and whoever wants to can come in, right? But those who understand the depth of their sin, the pervasiveness of their weakness. Not only that, but God's holiness and God's majesty, they shudder at the thought. We'll see in the following verses that God doesn't just let anybody in. He is selective. He says this kind of person and not that kind. It's a high privilege that Zion's inhabitants receive. It's also a distinctive privilege Their acceptance by God to dwell with him marks them out as unique from the rest of the mass of humanity. So we have here in verse one, the distinctive privilege of Zion's inhabitants. Consider next the genuine piety of Zion's inhabitants. Unfolding in these remaining verses, 11 descriptors of the kind of person who will be able to sojourn in Yahweh's tent and who will be able to dwell on his holy hill. So we'll look at the first characteristic. The text says, he who walks blamelessly. This is a blameless man. The walk here illustrates the way of life. This is not describing a one-time event or an occasional occurrence or even the best of intentions. No, this is a description of his actual life and his general pattern of life. He walks blamelessly. He has integrity. His character can't be impugned, nor can his manner of life be accused. Someone who pleases God, he fears God, and he demonstrates it in the way that he lives. It's also an honest person. The idea of this word here carries the idea of being whole. He doesn't act as though he were blameless when it suits him and then a different way in some other context. He has integrity. 
His godliness is honest and sincere. This is so important. A false godliness, a pretended godliness is a double sin because it both, it is both at the same time, ungodliness and deception. For the man whom God will accept, he is genuine. He has no secrets. Spurgeon says he is only right who is upright in walk and downright in honesty. Next, we see that this man works righteousness. If walking blameless is his manner and general pattern of life, working righteousness refers specifically to his outward actions. This man knows God's truth. He understands what the righteous requirement of God's law is upon him, and so he obeys it. He performs necessary duties. He obeys God's commands. He submits himself to God's will as far as it is revealed in Scripture and in providence. He conforms himself to the standard that he finds in God. He isn't passive in these matters. He's got work to do. He's active. Next, we see that he speaks truth in his heart. Speaks truth. So again, this is a man who knows the truth. He knows it well enough to speak it, and so he speaks it in his heart. If you've been attending GBC for some time, you've probably heard the term heart shepherding. This is a helpful term, and it's describing using God's truth to inform the heart and the mind. In the New Testament, in Romans 12, verse 2, Paul commands his audience to be transformed by the renewing of their mind. It's a similar idea here. The man whom God will let dwell on Mount Zion uses God's truth to reprove his own errant thinking, to lay low his idols, and to direct his heart towards right living, right thinking, right doctrine. And he loves the truth. When the truth does confront something in his life, he's got a tender conscience towards the word of God, and he submits to it. He doesn't fight against God's word. He doesn't eschew it. He doesn't wish it said something else. No, he recognizes God's own authority in God's words. And so he submits and he speaks it in his heart. The heart in scripture is the command center of the will, emotions, affections, desires, decisions. It's the very core of who this man is that God is describing, the kind of man that he will accept. The very core of who he is, he prioritizes truth. Which also, by the way, proves his genuineness in this as well. He isn't saying one thing with his mouth and then believing something different in his heart. The next characteristic here is that he does not slander with his tongue. He doesn't slander certainly wouldn't be acceptable for someone who loves truth to be slanderous. Those would be incongruent. Slander is damaging, defaming speech about someone else. It's gossip that is unverified and untrue. We live in a day when cancel culture is a thing. And depending on where you work or who you're connected to, one wrong word one word that goes against the spirit of the age can have you stripped of your place of work, your income, everything that comes along with that. And yet worse is the defamation of one's character, the defamation of one's reputation. Proverbs 22 verse 1 says that a good name is to be chosen over great wealth. If a man loses his reputation... He can lose his income, as I said, his place of work. He can lose also relationships, lose the ability to be hireable, as we've seen in our day, and he's put to shame. The verb here for slander has the idea of going about in secret like someone who is trying to spy out a land or spy out a city. In fact, it's this very word that was used when Joshua sent spies to spy out Jericho. God will not accept someone who is going about looking for gossip, 
and looking to spread slanderous accusations and lies. Don't look for gossip. Don't spread gossip. Just don't be a part of it. Proverbs 18, 18 says, excuse me, 18, 8 says, the words of a whisperer are like dainty morsels. They go down into the innermost parts of the stomach. The man who will dwell with God, even if he somehow overhears gossip, he doesn't love its sweetness, never makes it to his tongue, self-controlled. In fact, the expectation would be if he, if he loves truth in the heart, his tongue would be used for just the opposite. Truth would leak out of his mouth onto his tongue. Next we see that this man that God will accept does not do evil to his neighbor. James 3.2 says that if anyone can bridle his tongue, he's a perfect man. So we certainly wouldn't suppose that the man who is self-controlled in his speech would give himself the freedom to do evil in other cases. This is a man who doesn't harm, doesn't do anything with malicious intent, doesn't seek to do damage. And the text says that he does no evil to his neighbor. Maybe you're channeling your inner lawyer saying, well, who is my neighbor? It's anyone that God has brought into your life through providence. Much like the good Samaritan in Luke 10, Zion's inhabitants will be the kind of people who are on the lookout for a neighbor that they can do good to. In the equipping hour this morning, Jacob Hantla talked about hunting hospitality, and he teased that for next week's equipping hour. And I loved that phrase, looking forward to that equipping hour. This man is hunting. He's searching, eager to do good and no evil. This is reflected in God's law. Leviticus 19.18 says, You shall not take vengeance. You shall not keep your anger against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh. God makes his own character the basis for loving your neighbor as yourself and not doing evil to them. We see something similar in the New Testament. In Ephesians 4, 31 through 32, Paul writes, Let all bitterness and anger and wrath and shouting and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Instead, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, graciously forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has graciously forgiven you. So God is our example in this. Just as he graciously forgave his people in Christ, his people are to put away malice and to put on love. And this man that David's talking about, he, he does no evil. Next, we read that he neither takes up a reproach against his friend. He doesn't disgrace. A reproach here is a taunt. And it's a taunt on the basis of something shameful or disgraceful that was done. Someone did something that they ought to be ashamed of or said something they ought to be ashamed of, and now a reproach is brought to them by somebody else, and they are ridiculed and embarrassed. Even when a friend does something shameful or disgraceful, the godly man doesn't pile on. We have a new puppy at home, and we're currently potty training this puppy, and we were given the advice, the counsel, that when this puppy relieves herself inside the house, we, uh, you know, not harshly, but should bring her nose to the spot where she relieved herself and let her smell it as you tell her no. So that way she can understand this is the thing they're telling me no about. And it, it helps with clarity. The dog needs that. But when a friend, a neighbor, a brother has done something shameful, the godly man does not take any pleasure in rubbing their nose in it. Galatians 6, 1, we get some insight into this from the, the New Testament. 
It says, brothers, even if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. So even when there needs to be correction or shepherding care offered from friend to friend, the man of God, the man whom God will accept, is not joining in the taunt, is not adding to the shame. In fact, he's humble. We're actually all guilty of shameful sins before God, aren't we? The godly man isn't one to stay offended, to stay hurt, but he's willing to forgive just as he has been forgiven. He's willing to step in and help. Notice also that this is against his friend. This really is heartless, unloving to turn on a friend in a time when they are needed most. The word for a friend means something uh, like a close one. It's one that you have a close relationship to. So it very well could be a friend. It could also be a relative. But the godly man is, is loyal in his relationships. He's faithful in his relationships. And so he doesn't turn on them. He doesn't raise his voice against them. He wouldn't even join in if the rest of the world were doing so. In our day and age, we have become experts at being offended. A lot of times it's just virtue signaling. If you do something bad, then I get to yell at you and tell you how bad it was and act like I'm good because I hate the bad thing you did. And what that really does for me is it allows me to feel like I'm good without actually doing anything good. So this serves me. But God's man doesn't have to virtue signal because he actually is virtuous. He doesn't have to play those games. So he doesn't deny forgiveness. He doesn't raise his voice in the taunt. He doesn't join in and pile on. No, he's ready to forgive and help the friend, even the one who has done something shameful. Next, verse four, it says, in whose eyes a reprobate is despised. This man despises the reprobate. Really, these next two characteristics seem to go together as two sides of the same coin. He despises the reprobate and he honors God-fearers. You could say that he agrees with God. He matches his thoughts and his assessment with God's own assessment. So first, thinking about the reprobates, he, he recognizes those who are rejected by God for their pattern of life, and he despises them also, just as God does. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to hate everyone who is not a Christian. We also know he doesn't do evil, as we looked at just a few minutes ago. So what it does mean, though, is that when he takes God's opinion, God's thoughts into account, he falls in line with that opinion. So he won't be partial to those whom God has rejected. If there's a man of great import, of high rank, a high official, but he's unfaithful to Yahweh, the godly man is not going to prefer and admire that guy over one of God's lowliest slaves. The godly man is not going to prefer a rich reprobate to the righteous poor because he sees the world as God sees it. He assesses things as God assesses them. He doesn't idolize the reprobate. He doesn't get his spiritual counsel from them by any means. He doesn't give a good man's honor to a bad man. And on the flip side, you've got the next line in verse four, but who honors those who fear Yahweh? Those are the ones that he admires. Those are the ones that he sets his affections on. Those whom God loves, he loves. Those whom God cares for, he cares for. He commends them in his speech. He serves them in their preferences ahead of his own. He aids them when they need it, and he imitates them in their godliness. David writes Psalm 16, and we're told in the New Testament in Acts chapter 2 that he wrote this prophesying about Christ. 
And he said in verse 3 of Psalm 16, As for the saints who are in the earth, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. Christ loves his saints. They are majestic in his sight. And all his delight is in them. The godly man follows his Lord's lead in this. Next, he is not fickle. The man whom God will accept is not fickle. The last line in verse four says, he swears to his own hurt, does not change. It's a man of his word. He's a man who means what he says, even when he swore at his own expense. We have here vow language. In Leviticus 27, verses 10 and 33, the nation of Israel is told that if something has been promised to Yahweh like an animal, and this animal grows up to be a very fine animal, you can't switch it out for a bad one. Say, hey God, why don't you give me the really good animal and I've got this uh, raggedy one over here for you. That'll do, right? doesn't take the Lord's name in vain by doubling back on what is rightfully God's. But he's faithful in all his pledges to God and to man. And his word can be relied upon. This kind of person would stand out in our world today. I'm sure many of you have seen that in the workplace. You've experienced that. We just don't see this kind of commitment to honesty and integrity. Promise to a spouse is no longer a lifelong commitment. And a divorce can be pursued without anyone being at fault. Just about any agreement you make with a business, it requires a pages long contract about all the things they can do to you if you don't pay. Think if I stop paying my phone bill, they might come and get my kids. I don't know. I don't know what I signed. Listen, it is easier to keep your word when everything works out well. And it's really hard to keep it when you have sworn to your own loss. But that's what this man does. The man who will gain access to God, to his tent, to his mountain. He prizes his word and his integrity. He's trustworthy. Next, he is not exploitive does not put out his money at interest. Why does David bring up interest here? Is he condemning all interest outright? Do I need to stop at the bank on my way home because I gave them money and they're giving me interest into my account? No, I don't think that's what David is getting at here. In fact, in God's law, you have express permission to give interest. In Deuteronomy 23, 19, and 20, says, you shall not charge interest to your brother, interest on money, food, or anything that may be loaned at interest, but you may charge interest to a foreigner, but to your brother, you shall not charge interest. So God doesn't outlaw interest completely in the Old Testament, but there are situations where it cannot be done, you can, where you cannot give with interest. That's to a countryman. Now look at Leviticus 25. I'm going to start reading from verse 35. We looked at verse 35 earlier. I'm going to read down to verse 37. Now, if a brother of yours becomes poor and his means with regard to you falter, then you are to sustain him like a sojourner or a foreign resident that he may live with you. Do not take you serious interest from him, but fear your God, that your brother may live with you. You shall not give him your silver at interest, nor your food for gain. So the Israelites were not to take usurious interest. They were not to take usury or extreme interest, crippling interest on the things that an afflicted brother needed for his very life, as the text said. 
the things that he needed so that he may live with you. So don't give him money or the the very food that he needs to sustain himself at interest. Don't give these things with interest to the poor, to the ones who are the most needy and the most afflicted among us. That's the same idea here in Psalm 15. Don't take advantage of those in need. Don't take from the poor. This really can be applied not only to lending, but any form of making wealth that is predatory or takes advantage of someone else, especially the poor. The ones who will dwell with God now and forever, they don't love wealth this way. They're generous. They're willing to send out what they have, even without expectation of getting something in return. The way they give their money is generous and godly. And the way they bring in their money is godly as well. Look at the next line here. Nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. This man is not greedy. Does not elevate his desire for wealth above justice and equity. He isn't partial to the rich because of what he can gain, but he actually prizes truth above these things. Deuteronomy 16, 19 says, you shall not distort justice, you shall not be partial, and you shall not take a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and perverts the words of the righteous. Godly man will not cover his eyes to the truth or the reality around him so that he can profit unjustly. In his eyes, the people around him, the situations that he finds himself in are more than just opportunities for profit. They're more than just opportunities to go after the things that he wants. But he actually cares about what is right. He cares about the people that he interacts with and deals with. And so he wants to do justice and be fair and uphold equity. And he upholds justice because he fears God. Because he cares for people more than wealth. Now, we are at the end of this list. We've learned about the kind of person that will gain access to God. I want to make clear, David is not preaching salvation by works. He is not saying, do these things and you will earn a place at God's table by your own righteousness and in your own standing. No, David recognizes that this is all grace, even if he doesn't explicitly express that reality here in this psalm. Turn quickly to Psalm 51. We'll see David's expression of God's grace towards him. I'll just quickly read verses one through four. David says, be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the abundance of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you are justified when you speak and pure when you judge. Clearly, David recognizes his sin. He recognizes that he needs God's forgiveness and grace He's just like the rest of us. He needs his sins blotted out. So he's not preaching the gospel of self-righteousness here. He'd turn back to Psalm 15. We know that no one is saved by their works. It's impossible for it to be. But rather, anyone who is saved is saved because He is forgiven and saved by grace, as David knows. And then, with a new heart, he strives to obey God, walk in his ways, bring glory to him. And in this psalm, David is describing the character of one who knows God in this way. 
He's describing what a regenerate follower of Yahweh looks like, someone who has a new heart. So what are we to do with these verses and how ought they to impact us? Well, first, they should spark humble self-examination. If you assess your life and you do not fall under this description in any measure, you need to reassess your confession. Listen, there are many who will cry out to our Lord with that word, Lord, Lord. He will say, depart from me. I never knew you. You worker of iniquity, you lawless one. So this psalm ought to cause us with humility and sincerity to compare our lives to God's word and see if my profession of faith has any legitimacy at all. If I claim that I know God, I will live with him forever, then my life should display it. And it doesn't mean perfection. But do you have these qualities of godliness in you? even mixed with immaturity? Are you growing in these things the longer you are in Christ? This examination should cause us to reconsider, think about our obedience, our repentance. Is it thorough? Is it complete? And if you find your life lacking, turn to the cross. Turn to Christ. Confess those things. He's merciful and he is gracious. Bring your sin and lay it at his feet. And then, not to earn anything, but out of gratitude, thanksgiving, love, begin to walk in the ways that he prescribes. Still weak, still imperfect, but ever striving and growing. Secondly, these verses give us something to aim at. Categories to recognize our continued need to be growing in godliness. Even the one who possesses these qualities is by no means flawless. Not every idol has been conquered. There's still work to do. Kind of worshiper that God desires is not the one who only seems holy when he gets to the worship service, but he he actually is living these ways and he's growing in them. He has an earnest devotion to God and to his word all the time and his life displays it. This gives us a target. Give us some things to aim at, to compare our lives to and then seek to grow in godliness even more. So we've considered the genuine piety of Zion's inhabitants. Next, we will consider the lasting security of Zion's inhabitants. Look at this last part of verse five. He who does these things will never be shaken. Will never be shaken. This word means to be tottered over, knocked off, moved out of place, destroyed even. David says the righteous, those who obey God in this way, those who will find hospitality with God, they will never be shaken. And the Hebrew says quite literally, they won't be shaken to forever, forever and beyond. Same word here is used in Psalm 10, verse 6. Just a few pages over. The wicked in Psalm 10, verse 6 says in his heart, I will not be shaken from generation to generation. I will not be in any adversity. Then in 13, verse 4, David is asking God for help. Lest his enemy says, My ad- I have overcome him, and David's adversaries rejoice that he is shaken. The wicked do not assume that they will be shaken. 
They rejoice when they think the righteous is shaken. And here David settles the matter for his adversaries. Matter settled, he tells them once and for all that the righteous cannot be shaken forever. They are established and safe within the plan and purposes of God. That should be a comfort. The Christian cannot be shaken. They won't be. What does this mean for our trials? Can those topple us? Is God's purpose in our trials to knock us down and leave us in the dirt? No. We heard from Josh this morning, it's never true of God in our trials. He taught us that they are short and necessary, and God uses them to establish and strengthen us even further. Most of my prep for this passage I was doing before we knew what the results of the recent election would be, but it has impact for us regardless. I recognize that the outcome of the recent presidential election and many others is a kindness of God for our nation. And yet, our security does not come from what a president or voters might do. We trust God. Our security ultimately comes from God and no man. God is the one who upholds his people. God is the one who strengthens his people so that they can stand. So whose worship will God accept? Who will get to dwell with him now and forever? The kind of person that David describes here. And he will never be shaken. Let these things motivate genuine piety, earnest devotion, self-examination. May we be a people, a church, who worships God with our entire lives in every facet in these ways expressed here in Psalm 15 and in many others. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the clarity that it affords us. We thank you for these questions and and this answer. We ask for all of us here that we would be acceptable to you, that we would be pleasing to you, that we would walk in ways that bring glory to you. We ask that you would motivate a worshipful life, an obedient life in your people. And we ask that where we need to examine and reflect, that you would give us the grace to do that with sincerity and humility. We thank you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.